Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today's webinar, How to Create Your Own Six-Figure Law Firm, presented by John Corcoran. My name is Stephanie Phelan and I am a Marketing Manager at MyCase and I will be your host today. I'd like to give you a few tips about participating on GoToWebinar. The webinar control panel is on the right-hand side of your screen. This is where you may submit questions and where you'll see polls come up throughout the presentation. Please submit questions during the presentation and don't wait until the very end. We'll then save all your questions until the end of the presentation, and that's when John will answer what we've collected throughout the webinar. Also, please note that these slides, remaining questions, and recording will be available by end of day tomorrow on the MyCase blog, and it will also be emailed to all registrants. Also, the Twitter hashtag to follow the conversation is hashtag sixfigurefirm. Today's webinar is hosted by MyCase, so before we jump into things, I'd like to give a quick overview. MyCase is a web-based law practice management software that takes care of your daily practice requirements for calendaring, contact management, document management and templates, time and billing, client communications, custom workflows, and more in one solution at an affordable price. My case is priced for solo and small firms at just $39 a month for an attorney and $29 a month for paralegal or support staff. We also offer My Case websites for our customers. The cost to set up and build your website is only $500 and then there's a $50 per month maintenance fee. We use a modern professional design built for your firm. The websites contain social media and blog integration. And best of all, complete integration with MyCase practice management software. Now you and your customers can log into MyCase directly from your website. Last but not least, we enjoy hosting educational events for professionals in the legal industry, and that is why we're all here today. Now let me tell you a little bit about our presenter. John Corcoran is an attorney, a former Clinton White House writer, and speech writer to the governor of California. His writing has been featured in Forbes, The Huffington Post, Business Insider, along with dozens of other publications and blogs. His career has taken him from politics to Hollywood to the heart of Silicon Valley and to law. After a few years, long unhappy years at two different law firms, John opened his own boutique law firm in San Francisco. He has such success that his friends and former colleagues asked him to coffee so they could pick his brain about how he was so successful in starting his own firm. John donated a lot of time to helping others jumpstart their firms and he started creating a guide and eventually developed the Smart Business Revolution. John, thanks so much for being here and sharing your tips and tricks for a fruitful and thriving firm. I'll let you take it from here. Stephanie, thank you so much, and I appreciate that nice introduction, and thank you everyone for uh, logging in here. we got a lot of people who logged in, and we're going to cover a lot of material and not a lot of time, so I'm going to move really quickly through the material. This is a topic, as Stephanie mentioned, that I'm pretty passionate about. I love inspiring other lawyers to start their own law firm. I know so many lawyers that are unhappy working for an, uh, another law firm, a big firm, small firm, you name it. Um, and there are so many different tools like my case and others out there that have emerged in just recent half decade or decade or so that have made it so much more possible. So we're going to cover some of that. I'm also going to cover some of the changes that are happening uh, in the legal profession that are affecting all of you, all of us as practicing lawyers. So. I'm going to cover all of that, uh, but first I want to give you guys an incentive for sticking around. Uh, we got two different incentives actually, a free little gift at the end. Rather than covering all the different tools and technology and the mine, you know, many, many different options you have, I created a 10-page guide on different tools and technologies you can use, many of which are completely free or very inexpensive um, to start your own law firm. And so I got that and I'm going to be emailing that out. Actually, I'm going to be mentioning, I mentioned the URL at the end of the presentation. I've got another gift as well that I'm emailing out to all of you. And then Stephanie, do you want to mention the uh, Amazon gift card? Oh, sure. Yeah. Was, um, we'll give away a $50 Amazon gift card at the end for, uh, we'll draw it from those who complete the survey at the end as well. Thanks, John. 
Very cool. Cool. Okay, so here's the agenda. Here's what we're going we're gonna to be talking about. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story, my background, as going from an unhappy associate at a couple of different firms to a thriving solo. I'm going to talk about how the changing legal industry is affecting today's law firm. I'm going to talk about how to develop a strategy for your law firm in order to achieve leverage and increase profits, how to navigate business cycles, how to create consistent marketing to prevent roller coaster results. I'm going to tell you about an advanced training option if you're interested in working with me a little bit further to talk about some of the ideas we're talking about here, and then we'll do some Q&A at the end, okay? And we got a couple of polls uh, throughout it to keep make sure everyone's on their toes and paying attention. So let's start with that. Do you love your law practice right now? I'd love to know what your answer is. You can just answer directly. Uh, the poll should be right in front of you. I'm seeing it in front of me. Select yes or no. And we'll give a few seconds for it, and then uh, Stephanie will tell us what the results are. Yes or no, do you love your law practice right now? Yeah, perfect. And it looks like uh, the majority of people have voted, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll right now. And I'll share the results with everyone. So 44% say that, yes, they love their law practice right now, and 56% no, not so much. Is, so, is that about uh, what you expected? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting result. So the, I wonder, I'm wondering what the 44% are hoping to get out of this. <laughs> Hopefully some additional perspectives, some additional ideas, ways in which you can always be improving things, even if you do already love your law practice. Maybe there's some changes that you want to make. Maybe you want to move into a new practice area or something like that. If you don't love your law practice right now, I want, by the end of this presentation, to inspire you to at least take some action. You might not start your firm today. You might not start it next week or next month. But I want you to take some action to think about what can I do to change things. It could be something small like moving into a new practice area. It could be something large like starting your own law firm. It could be something major like switching to a completely new industry without even practicing law. But lawyers tend to be very analytical, and I'd like to inspire you to take some action at the end of this webinar. So about me. Uh, I graduated in 2007, and when I graduated, I $127,000 in law school debt. Today, that might be small by comparison because uh, law school tuition has gone up so dramatically. Uh, but I graduated in 2007, and then for about four years, I worked as an associate at two small law firms, and I was really unhappy. I just didn't like the work that I was doing. And you probably all experienced something like this. I didn't like the work I was doing. I didn't like the work I was doing for them. I didn't like the areas of law I was in. I tried all kinds of different areas of law. None of them seemed to fit. And I really was unhappy. I was thinking even about leaving law or doing something completely different entirely. I had gone back to law school after six years of being out of college. So it was, it was kind of a later progression for me. I didn't go directly through. And um, so I did a lot of thinking, thought it through. I finally decided in 2011 to launch my own law firm. And you'll see in this presentation why it's a lot more manageable and why that actually gives you some amazing freedom. Um, and I found that you know, even people who are considering leaving law who then go start their own law firm, that autonomy, that control over what they're doing actually makes them a lot happy, happier than they ever were practicing law at a law firm. And so when I started my firm, I tried a one-size-fits-all strategy for getting clients. And this is really the main thing you need to focus on when you're starting. Uh, you know, everything else can work out. When you're starting a law firm, the most important thing is getting clients in the door, hands down. Everything else you can figure out, tools, technology, whatever, you can figure it out, research. But the main thing was getting clients, and so I did a bit of everything. I did networking, joining boards, volunteering, advertising, blogging. It was very unfocused, and it wasn't really uh, zeroed in on the things that made that really moved the needle. And so that I call that kind of Corcoran Law Firm 1.0. I tried it all. And I, I really, at the time, I wanted to work with business clients, but I struggled to close them. I struggled to convince them to work with me. I was doing, actually, at the time, uh, around 2010, 2009, when the real estate market was horrible, I'd been doing some real estate law work. So I started doing these really low-profit, short-sale consultations, where it was a one-off type of situation, very low margin, didn't make much money off of it, and it didn't turn into ongoing clients. It wasn't the kind of clients I wanted to work with, and I was really struggling to define my niche and to attract clients. But in 2012, after about a year of working for myself, I discovered a much, much better approach, which was a lot more effective, and I was able to redefine my practice. I went completely 180 degrees from real estate short sales to focusing on working with business owners and entrepreneurs, which really engaged and inspired me. It was people that I really enjoyed working with. 
I developed a standout strategy through writing, writing for various publications where other professionals and lawyers would get to know me. And I, I had these funny, you know, situations where I'd be at like a bar function and some very senior attorney who I knew who they were would greet me by name, would know my name. And I was like, how do they know my name? And it was because I did this, I had this standout strategy, which was um, getting my name out there, uh, putting on events, writing, writing articles in the VAR newsletter. Um, I also restarted the business law section with another attorney and we got that help to for people to associate our names as business lawyers, um, organized events for business lawyers. And over time, my revenue increased and I was able to work less frequently. And it actually freed up my time in order to start side pursuits, which is something I've really been passionate about and something that a lot of lawyers I know uh, get a lot of satisfaction out of being able to not just practice law, but also uh, have a side pursuit, whatever that may be. And so Smart Business Revolution is my main uh, blog and Six Figure Law law firm is my training program for lawyers and so I created both of those after um, first streamlining my practice and then uh, in the first three years I made over five hundred thousand dollars in revenue that might not be a huge number for some of you that might be a very large number for others of you but the point is is that shifting is possible changing your practice is possible I've been very fortunate I've been profiled in Forbes I've been selected as a super war lawyer rising star a couple times I still have no clue how um, I've been profiled in the book Stand Out, which came out earlier this year. Excellent book by Dory Clark. But you know, the next point I really want to um, I want to tell you guys about is the importance of the disruption that is coming to the legal industry. And I am not one of these people who thinks that oh, legal legal profession is not going to be changed. I'm actually the I'm the son of a travel agent. My mother was a travel agent. That industry was completely uh, decimated. And there are many other industries that have been completely upended. And I think the legal profession is absolutely going to be disrupted by the emergence of technology in the years ahead. This is an amazing quote from TechCrunch. Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. And Airbnb, which by the way is about three years old, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. Something interesting is happening. Don't think that this is not going to affect the legal profession as well. Here's some other industries that are completely being disrupted. Taxis, transportation, Uber is doing that. Travel agencies, as I mentioned, tax preparation, TurboTax has completely disrupted that industry. Newspapers, Craigslist, upended it. Dictation and proofreading are even being up. These are, notice that a lot of these are service-based. Uh, booksellers, Amazon, job recruiters, LinkedIn has disrupted that industry. Hotels and motels, Airbnb, industries that we thought couldn't be disrupted. Brick and mortar industries are being disrupted. Manufacturing, 3D printing, if you've studied that at all, if you've learned into that, looked into that at all, that's going to have a dramatic impact on manufacturing and distribution in the years ahead and very close ahead. LexisNexis put out something called the Enterprise Legal Management Trends Report a couple of years ago it's from 2013, and it showed that more work is shifting from large law firms down to smaller law firms for a number of key reasons, in part because technology is making it a lot more possible for smaller firm attorneys in order to work on matters, either pieces of matters or larger matters. And firms with 201 to 500 lawyers actually doubled their share of high fee litigation matters. So that's matters over $1 million billed from 22% in 2010 to 41% in 2013. So that's a three year period that the firms of that size doubled their share of high fee litigation matters. So that's a big shift from larger firms down to smaller firms. The share of U.S. legal fees paid by clients to firms with more than 750 lawyers dropped from 26 to 20 percent between 2010 and 2013. These are the most recent numbers I've been able to find. There might be different numbers as well. Uh, let's do another quick poll. So this, in this poll, I want to ask you guys, how much do you think it costs to start a new law firm today? I'd love to know what your thoughts are on this. Stephanie? Yeah, and I've launched the poll, and the results are coming in. And let's see, I'll go ahead and close the poll. I'm really curious about this one. <laughs> okay, let's close that and we'll share the results. Okay. Oh, interesting. About split between 1,000 and 10,000. And there's yeah. probably a bunch of people who are saying, damn it, I wanted it to be 2,500 or 4,000 or whatever number <laughs> they were thinking of. Yeah, that's a big difference, big monetary difference, but a very yeah. equal um, 
result. That's interesting. But very few up at the 13 percent. Only thirteen yeah. percent saying thirty thousand. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, obviously it it varies depending on what city you're in, where you're located. Um, what size firm you want to create. But the truth is that technology is make, making it a lot easier today to start your own law firm. I think it's a lot closer to 1,000 than 10,000. It's going to vary a lot based on the decisions that you make. Um, but if you repurpose a lot of different um, tools that you already have at your dis disposal, then you can keep your costs dramatically down. So there's a number of different changes that have happened in recent years, which are fascinating. About five or six years ago, I worked for a firm that was relatively new, and the, the managing partner had just started it, and he went out and he had to buy, I can't remember how much it was, I think it was like a five or $10,000, maybe a $10,000 server that was like the backup to uh, that hosted all of our files. And it just like sat in a closet, it broke down like, every, like really frequently. Um, it was very expensive, and then once a week, he would take this really antiquated looking tape dispenser thing back to his house and put it as in his safe over the weekend and then he'd bring it back on Monday morning. It seemed so antiquated. And that he had he had to purchase that when he started the firm. Well just like three or four years later when I started my own firm, I started with Dropbox. Dropbox was more secure, had a whole team of backup, it was cloud based, so it was constantly improving. It's allowed me to use independent contractors and to share files very easily. And when I started, Dropbox was a hundred, I think it was a hundred gigabytes for ten dollars a month. And as I was hitting, I was getting really close to that that ceiling of 100 gigabytes and I was like oh man I'm gonna have to upgrade the next level is like 20 or 30 bucks a month or something like that I was like I'm gonna have to upgrade or delete files or something and then boom they said instead of 100 gigabytes a month you get a, a terabyte so it was like a thousand I think that is a thousand gigabytes uh, a terabyte for the same cost this is amazing that kind of change you know computers way more powerful today. You used to have to spend thousands of dollars on a phone system. Today you can get away with just using a cell phone. I know many lawyers who just use a cell phone or an iPhone, um, which is more powerful than a computer from five or six years ago. Um, research uh, tools have, have changed dramatically. You can use Google Scholar instead of having an expensive research ser service. You don't have to even have to buy expensive software like Microsoft Outlook or other Microsoft products if you don't want to. You can use Google Apps, which are free or very inexpensive. I mean, even teleconferencing systems. People, you have to, sp have to spend thousands of dollars in teleconferencing systems. Now you can use Skype, which is completely free. I've got clients all over the globe uh, in Australia, um, in Thailand, in England, in Asia, and I communicate with them via Skype or via email, and it's it's amazing. So the cost of starting a firm is much lower, and crowd, cloud practice management software, like my case, of course, has made it a lot easier. You, you used to have to spend, I remember when I started my firm four years ago, I looked into some of the practice management software solutions out there, and it was like multi-thousand dollars to buy a buggy software that I hadn't liked at my previous firm that would sit on my local computer, wouldn't be updated until I bought an expensive upgrade and then had to install it with CDs. My laptop today actually doesn't even have a CD-ROM drive. Um, and you know, rather than something cloud-based, which is a lot less expensive, no upfront costs, and is constantly improving because it's cloud-based. Uh, and then, you know, other sorts of things, as I mentioned, VoIP uh, phones versus expensive telephone systems. You don't really need a secretary. You can also use outsourced service like I think Call Ruby or Get Ruby is, is one of them out there if you want to have someone answering your phone for you, although it's not really necessary. Uh, Legal Match is a, a lead, you know, there are a lot of lead referral services out there that can farm leads your way. Um, social networking is absolutely affecting uh, the legal industry. Um, artificial intelligence, boy, I mean, I've got an example for that in a second, but that's going to affect the legal industry. Even if some of you are rolling your eyes, I absolutely am convinced it's going to affect the legal industry. Uh, Self-help legal document sites and virtual law firms like Axiom, which I'm going to mention in a moment. Um, and by the way, if you check out this link, bit.ly.com after we're done, slash solo dash costs, um, that will take you directly to uh, an article, an infographic that uh, my case created on the cost of running a small town solo practice. So it's got some inf interesting information in there. Um, and then there was a comment down at the bottom underneath that article, which I just wanted to uh, pull out for you because this person, Kevin, said, 1995, when I started as a solo, my laptop with WordPerfect for Windows and time slips cost me about 3800 My printer was expensive, too. 
It weighs more than the TV in my bedroom. Uh, and then he has to spend another 1700 a month on Yellow Pages and Donnelly Directory, which I've never even heard of, for two different counties. Just amazing how much more expensive it was 20 years ago to start a firm. And now today you can easily buy a laptop for under $1,000 or a good Mac, which is what I use, um, for 1500 or so. Um, and then there's this article by Carolyn Elephant over at My Shingle about Axiom Legal. This was really interesting. Axiom Legal um, is a law firm that um, charges a lot less, and they I, I don't think they're centralized. They, everyone works from their own offices or their own um, homes, all the different lawyers that work for them. But they're eating, eating away, taking a lot of work away from traditional big firms. And she says they handle fairly routine but complex legal matters for corporate clients, compliance, litigation, and transactional rates like 130 an hour for regulatory compliance matters and 150 an hour for litigation. There's simply no way I or any solos I know for that matter can compete. That's just an example of how disruption is affecting the legal industry right now. Look at this. This is an article from the Wall Street Journal. You can check this out after we're done as well. Uh, Google spent about $400, $500 million, I think about six months ago, to acquire this company called DeepMind. DeepMind, this article said, DeepMind burst into the limelight last year when it published a paper in Nature that showed how a computer could be programmed to teach itself to play Atari games better than most humans. You can watch the video of this actually happening. The computer at first knows nothing of the rules for this Atari game, and eventually it starts figuring out the rules, and then it starts playing, and then it starts playing better than a human could. And that's something that's happening today. Well, so what can you do about changing legal industry? Well, I don't have all the answers. I, if I did, I'd be making a lot more money than I am right now. But one of the things you could do is you can keep track of what's happening. Keep track of what changes are happening that are affecting the legal industry. Don't bury your head in the sand in the years ahead. But monitor what other successful lawyers are doing. There are going to be a lot of loud complainers. There are right now. There are going to be a lot of loud complainers who just complain about it, but they don't know what the solutions are. And I think fundamentally the most important thing you can do is don't listen to them Listen to the ones who are doing something about it and who are making a difference and who are modifying their practice or finding other sources of revenue in order to continue practicing and thriving rather than doing things the way that they were done 20 years ago. Also look for opportunities. There are amazing opportunities that are coming along today through blogging, podcasting, video, etc. Uh, I'm going to give you some examples in a moment of some other lawyers who are really creating some amazing opportunities for themselves through social media and whatnot. Uh, for example, um, Jacob Sapochnik, maybe you've heard of him. He's got a podcast. He's got uh, over 118,000 Facebook fans for his San Diego Immigration Lawyer Facebook page. And I, I've interviewed him before, and Jacob says that he's got – he you basically over 10 years, he – built such a consistent flow of clients, immigration clients coming in through his Facebook page that he just had to keep on hiring up staff, more and more staff to manage all the incoming volume. And um, it's just amazing the impact that that's had. Gina Cho is another legal innovator who I think you should check out. You can follow her on Twitter, big into meditation and mindfulness. Um, how to evaluate whether you should start your own law firm. Let's dive into this topic. So here's a quick poll first, and uh, Stephanie, we can jump into this. What is the first thing you should do when thinking about starting your own law firm? Select one of the following. So the options are print business cards, set up a website and get started with SEO, begin blogging, or none of these. Okay, great. Yep, and the votes are coming in. Um, all right, and if everyone can place their vote, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and share our results. Okay, so 11% said print business cards, 30% said set up a website and get started with SEO, 8% okay. said blogging, and then 51% maybe think that you're tricking them and said none of these. <laughs> I shouldn't have given that as an option. That's the easy out. Ah, he's tricking me. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm tricking you. Um, yeah, you know, actually, honestly, I don't think any of those is, is right. I mean, sure, it's not going to harm you to spend too much, you know, a little bit of time setting up a website. Um, SEO, I would not mess with that yourself because it's a constantly changing field. It's not something, it's like practicing law without a license. It's not something that you should do. It should, you should leave it to the experts. And printing business cards, it may cost 10 bucks, so it's not that big a deal. You can, you can order them online. Um, and blogging is always good. I mean, I did that when I was working at another firm. But the, the real answer or the real reason I mentioned this is 
really, there's a couple other things I think you should be doing if you're evaluating whether you should start your own firm. And one of the most powerful things I did was measuring and tracking incoming referrals to me. So you know, this is assuming that you're working at another firm before you start your own firm, which I highly recommend. I think it's a lot more difficult if you're working like in a government organization or uh, for a nonprofit or something like that, not practicing law, and you want to go start your own firm. It's a lot easier if you're working for another firm doing something similar and you want to start your own firm. So measuring and tracking those incoming referrals and tracking how much income is coming in, how much revenue is coming in. What I basically did is I started tracking everything that was coming in, and when it reached the point where I realized, hey, you know, I've got enough work coming in that this could cover my current salary, then that's when I decided, okay, it's time for me to go out on my own. And the reality was it actually was a lot better than I expected because I found if you've done work to establish relationships with other lawyers, then they're going to want to help you, especially other senior attorneys, which leads me to my second point, which is begin meeting with senior attorneys in your practice area. There are going to be many senior attorneys who work in the same practice area as you who would love to impart some of their wisdom, right? I mean, lawyers love to talk, right? So if you just you know befriend them, and they see you as an up-and-coming star, and they want to help you out a little bit. What I found what was a big source of revenue when I first started out was simply other more senior attorneys who had kind of throwaway work to them that they, you know, it was like too low rate for them, um, and they didn't want it, so they would just send it over my way, and their scraps were my dinner, you know? <laughs> and so you can make a great living off of that. I think that's a great strategy. And then the other thing that I think you can do to gauge whether you start your own firm is by elevating your profile. That will help you determine what kind of interest is out there, what types of clients are being referred to you, how people, um, you know, in, in your legal community, how they view you. So, you know, writing, speaking, and getting involved with bar associations is a great way in order to elevate your profile. Now, the wrong way to start your law firm, these are the things you should not be doing. One, locking yourself into an expensive lease. One thing I highly recommend doing is finding some kind of alternative arrangement. Maybe you can find a law firm that's got an extra office or a couple of offices that they would sublease to you and you uh, instead of paying them money for it you agree that you'll work a certain number of hours for them that gives you a little bit of legal work and you don't have to pay revenue you don't have to pay rent um, and then eventually over time you'll probably reach a point where it doesn't make any more sense for you to do that it makes more sense for you to just bill at your normal hourly, hourly rate to your clients and then to pay for the rent Another thing you shouldn't do is prepaying for very expensive legal research systems, especially if you're not certain how much you're going to need them when you uh, get started. Just because you really used it extensively with the, at your previous firm doesn't mean that you're going to need it as extensively for your new firm. Uh, buying top-of-the-line office furniture, really not necessary. Starting a new practice area immediately, not a great idea. I think it's better to phase these things slower over time. It's better to go from one practice area to the same practice area in your new firm, and then not having any savings, of course. You need to have some kind of rainy day fund. And then the right way to start your firm is to find month-to-month -month shared office space or work in exchange for rent, as I mentioned, or work from home. You can even do that as well. You could get one of these uh, virtual office addresses that gives you, it seems like a professional address um, in uh, in a you know downtown location, but it's actually just where your mail goes. Or you can even have your mail forwarded to you at home, but people don't know any different. Um, they can even answer your phones often. Regis is one of those that's, that does that. Um, it, using free or inexpensive research sources. So you know, use your law library and the report that I'm going to send you guys afterwards. Or going to mention you guys at the end. Um, using cloud-based software systems, lower upfront costs, and then repurposing computers and furniture. I mean, when I started, I just used a laptop that was my home laptop. Um, I purchased a, a printer, was, which was very inexpensive. Um, eventually, I purchased a secondary monitor, and I purchased a high-speed scanner. Those are the main purchases that I made, and that was it. Um, now, when you start your law firm, there's basically five simple things you need. This is very straightforward, simple things. One, you need somewhere to work. Number two, you need a practice or business management software. You need the ability to communicate with people. And you need billing or payment software. And you need the ability to do research. That's it. You can keep these things very, very simple. And you can keep your costs down. And the more you keep your costs down, the greater flexibility you have as you get started. I want to give you an example of how achievable this is. So, you know, let's say your goal is to make nice round number $10,000 in your first month. Well, this is really amazingly achievable and you benefit from the passage of time. So $10,000 divided by let's say $250 per hour equals 40 hours a month. 
That's just 10 hours per week, 10 hours per week build, 10 hours per week build. That's just really just one to two clients per week. It could be one client per week, you know, and over time what you benefit from is you have more former clients who hopefully you've done a good job for and they may get back in touch with you again in the future. And that's actually what you should be doing. I'm going to talk about that in a moment is making sure to keep in touch with your past clients because that is one of the best sources of new clients in the future is keeping in touch with your past clients, making sure that they don't forget about you and you don't forget about them. Not bugging them every three months and saying, hey, do you have any more work for me? But being of value to them. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit. And then how to navigate the business roller coaster. So I'm going to cover two things here, two core ideas, principles here. Number one is forging key relationships, and number two is consistency. And this is stuff that people love to use derogatory buzzwords and refer to it as like kind of soft skills where they say that, yeah, this is not rocket science. <laughs> I love it when people say that because usually those are the people that are struggling. People don't realize the importance of it. This stuff is so important to creating a business that you will love. So, number one, forging key relationships with high-value clients and referral partners. So the problem really with this is what pe the, one of the top objections I get from people is they, then I call it no time disease. So they're like, oh, I am so busy. They get so busy. You know, I, I've got, oh, I've got all this billable work I've got to do, or if you're lucky, um, <clears throat> or they have a family or they live in a small town. So it'd be difficult to go, you know, to events. But the, the reality is the problem is that you just need to be efficient and laser focused on which potential clients to target. What I find the problem that people make is that they're doing a scattershot approach like I did at the beginning or they're just building relationships with everyone or people that they've known for a long time rather than the right people, rather than being really focused, figuring out who are the types of ideal clients that they want, the ones that will lead to good revenues in the door and the good referral partners and then really focusing on them. That's really the a much better approach. <clears throat> so the typical advice for someone who's having time management problems or feel like they have no time is something like, oh, you need to download a new app, try out a new app, or read another book on productivity, or try a new productivity system, which often doesn't work. This type of typical advice does not work. I've tried it all. It's just not the great solution. What I present to you as a much better solution is what I call the conversation list strategy. What is a conversation list strategy? Your conversation list is a list of the 50 people plus people who you want to deepen a relationship with over the course of the next 12 months. I guarantee you hardly anyone on this webinar right now has done this exercise before. But simply, simply what it is is taking the time, should take no more than 15 to 20 minutes, to sit down and write out a list, you can do it on Excel spreadsheet or a piece of paper or whatever, write out a list of the 50 people who you want to deepen your relationship with over the course of the next 12 months. And these could be a variety of different types of people. Um, I'm going to mention that in a moment. But first, there are three parts of the conversation list strategy. It's not just about people, but it's also about organizations and events because that will affect the flow of new clients into your firm as well. So it also involves uh, identifying, I usually suggest eight to ten organizations that you'd like to deepen your involvement with, and then another list of eight to ten events that you'd like to deepen your involvement with. So that's like conferences or um, quarterly events or something like that that aren't tied directly to an organization. So you're putting together these lists, it's kind of like a brainstorm list to give yourself a roadmap of the people, organizations, and events who are going to lead to the referral, is going to lead to the clients that will come in the door to your firm and lead to greater revenues. This is the entire flow. Okay, so here's a very simple version of what it can look like. You can just create it in Google Drive or in Excel or something like that. First name, last name, maybe a few notes about the person, maybe their website. And then another thing I like to write on there is a way in which I can be of help to that person. Because this is about helping other people, not just about uh, trying to extract value from them. That's going to be the wrong approach, but being helpful to people. And some lawyers struggle with that because they don't know where to draw the line. They, you know, they want to get paid for their expertise. So it's like you don't want to go out and spend hours and hours giving them a bunch of free legal advice. That's not the right approach. But there are a lot of other ways that you can be helpful to people. Some of the best clients that I've gotten has just been being nice to people, being helpful to people in other areas. Like I find out someone is you know, looking for an ideal birthday location for their five-year-old, 
And so I send them a recommendation of four parks in the area that would be ideal for a five-year-old's birthday party. You do something small like that, and then you know you'll find like a month later, all of a sudden they come back there. Hey, do you do this kind of this this kind of law? And it's like, well, oh, that's interesting because that's probably why they came back to me. So putting together a list, highly recommend it. And then I say 50 plus because start with a good round number of 50, but it's probably a list that you should, it is a list that you should be evolving and adapting over time. You should making make changes to it. So the question that I frequently get is, well, who should be on my conversation list? Who should I put on there? Well, certainly other attorneys, senior attorneys in your uh, area, other attorneys who you consider more colleagues or friends, put them on there as well. People that you, that, who's, who are doing work that you like, uh, people whose values resonate with you, um, VIPs and influencers. So if you're in a particular industry and there are VIPs and influencers in this industry for the practice area that you want to focus in, let's say it's like pharmaceutical law or something like that, that you would know who these people are. You put these people on there or maybe do a little bit of research to find some people on there. Another one is friends of friends. So, you know, one step connections. You can look on something like LinkedIn and look at your friends, friends and connections and, and figure out uh, people who you'd like to connect with. You can use something like Facebook or Twitter as well to look for more people. Um, potential and existing clients and past clients. You know, write down on this list, put down on this list. Here's an ideal client, someone who I'd like to serve, I'd like to work with. Write them down on the list and then figure out a way to get to know them. Um, people who understand the reciprocity system, certainly you want people who, want, who, who understand that this is uh, about reciprocity back and forth. There's an excellent book called Give and Take by Adam Grant. I highly recommend it. And the basic premise behind that book is that people who are givers, so people who are more, more likely to give and help other people, are far more likely, according to a number of different academic studies, to rise to the top of the success ladder in life and in business. And he uses a number of very engaging examples. Highly recommend that book. Um, and people who you connect with, who you have a bond or connection with, Let's talk about strategy number two, consistency, the importance of being consistent over time. Because this is another one that I hear frequently from different uh, webinars and, and surveys and, and uh, emails that I get from people is, is um, the, the struggles of being consistent over time. So let's do a quick poll here, one more quick poll. If you want more clients, which should you focus on? And it's like one of the following. One, networking and meeting new people. Two, joining boards and committees. Uh, or three, reconnecting with old friends. Okay, great. Those uh, results are streaming in right now. If you can please finish and go ahead and make your selection. I'm going to close the poll. All right, and share our results. So 53% said networking and meeting new people. Your previous slides must have inspired. 12% um, <laughs> said joining boards and committees, and 35% said reconnecting with old friends. Well, the funny thing is, and I'm not surprised by this result, because oftentimes when I ask people what they're doing to try and get new clients, it has to do with that going out and meeting new people. But there's an idea, I don't have enough time to talk about it here, but there's an idea of, um, and Adam Grant has written about this, of, of our weak ties. So these are people who we previously had close relationships with, who we have fallen out of touch with. And these are actually the people that already have built-in trust for us. We already, maybe they were a neighbor in college. Maybe they were a colleague at an old company. Uh, maybe you uh, live next door to each other, whatever. Maybe you were friends, but you just have fallen out of touch. And you actually can get more bang for your buck by reconnecting with people like that. And potential, you know, past clients actually falls into that category as well because they've also built up that trust. When you meet someone new, it takes a little while for them to build up trust in you. And so you have to be consistent over time. So it's a longer play. It takes more time to play out. Um, okay, so how do you deliver ongoing value and how do you deliver a relationship consistently over time? How do you deliver that value later in a relationship? How do you, you know, another thing people struggle with, how do you avoid feeling like you're selling or being salesy or, you know, how do you communicate without bothering someone? Well, for that I want to mention is because I think this is important. When you have a, a relationship with anyone, you, this, is, this is how it goes. 
first you have no relationship with that person and then over the passage of time there's there can be a warm up period which is before you actually meet the person especially today with social media if it's someone you want to meet and get to know you can use social media in order to warm up the relationship before you've actually been introduced or met that person then there's an introduction and an initial meeting and then there's the key part on the right which is the follow up or the deepening of the relationship here's where so many people fail they just stop they meet, you know, you go out to a, a networking event or a cocktail party or something like that, you meet someone, and then that's it. You, maybe you exchange business cards, and that's it. And a lot of people say that they don't like going to cocktail parties, and yet they doom themselves to re repeat, to go back on the hamster wheel over and over again to all these cocktail parties and networking events because they don't follow up with people that they meet. So that is really incredibly important if you don't want to always be going out to cocktail parties and networking events. And so I talk about this idea of the relationship value funnel, which is basically kind of like a sales funnel, which is you're taking leads and you're moving them along through the funnel. You start with someone who has no awareness of you, and then you move to a place where they have knowledge of who you are, but not any trust or, or you know, affinity for you. And then you move into positive affinity, so they like what you're doing, but they don't maybe trust you yet, but they like what you're doing. And then you move to trust and then when you get past trust, you can get to mutual reciprocity. And that's really the promised land. That's where you want to be. You want to move as many people from no awareness all the way up through the funnel to mutual reciprocity as much as you can as possible. And so the solution to do that is to be the value delivering tortoise, not the hare. You know the idea of the tortoise and not the hare. It's really important to be the tortoise, not the hare. Deliver relevant value. There are two parts to this, delivering relevant value at the right times. And number two, using tools to scale your efforts. And we only have about, I don't know, six or seven minutes left. So I'm going to, before we want to, uh, I want to turn things back over to Stephanie. So I'm going to run through these kind of quickly. But what is relevant value at the right times? One is um, looking for opportunities to help. And I mentioned this earlier, but basically whenever you see an opportunity for someone on your conversations list or someone who you trust, someone you admire, particularly someone who's influential in your industry, a senior attorney or something like that, look for opportunities to help. And this is one of my favorite things. Every time I go to lunch with another attorney or someone like that, I listen. I listen closely for opportunities. Do they have a new business that they're launching? Do they have a new book they're putting out? Do they have a family member who's looking for a job? Are they going on vacation and they need a recommendation of a hotel somewhere to stay uh, or a restaurant to go to? Those little things are ways that you build up trust with people. Another powerful relevant way to provide value at the right time is using powerful relevant introductions. So introducing other people. If you want introductions that are valuable to you, make introductions for other people okay and then sharing articles of interest so just literally some simple thing like saying like hey I saw this article I know that you're passionate about backyard gardening or whatever it is I saw this article I thought it might be of interest to you I interviewed a guy and he's Steve Sims who he's got this great strategy he whenever he's traveling he'll look through magazines and if he sees like a, a glossy picture of something that think, makes him think of one of his clients he will write a note directly on there with a Sharpie, fold it up, put it in a hotel envelope for the hotel he was at, and then mail it off to the client. And those little touches make such a powerful difference. And remember now, the most relevant value to a person may not be your encyclopedic knowledge of the rules of civil procedure. So it could be something just very personal. It could be just something, you know, normal human to have nothing to do with you being a lawyer, but you, that little bit of value, your knowledge of the best hotel to stay at in Cancun or the best Thai restaurant to go to on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. That type of value can just make someone build their way up the relationship value funnel into a place of trust with you. Another, th another point here I want to make is using tools to scale your efforts. I'm a big fan of these and a lot of these are cloud-based, very soft, very uh, inexpensive or free, um, using a CRM program. So this is a, a really powerful tool that you can use. I use one called Contactually. There are other ones like Insightly, you've heard of Salesforce probably, um, that are basically managing all the relationships that lead to revenues. Okay, so the relationships lead to revenues, therefore you need to manage the relationships. And the CRM program helps you do that across multiple different platforms. 
They're very easy to use, and I, I use them for making introductions all day long. Uh, intro.net is another uh, is actually a free tool for making introductions that you can use if you don't have a CRM program. A blog is another one you can use. I'm going to mention an example in a moment. And an email newsletter. That's a little bit of an advanced option, but I mention it because starting an email newsletter and building up an e email newsletter for me over the last couple of years has been very powerful and has been um, uh, has really increased my revenues personally. Um, Put your conversations list in contactually. So the next step after you've created your conversation list is putting it in your CRM program. So I use contactually. You can use a different one. But basically taking it and then putting it in there. And like, for example, in contactually, they have uh, what they call buckets, which is basically just taking people that are high priority and, and, and saying, like, this is how frequently I want to follow up with them. And as opposed to, like, putting something in a calendar where you just get a calendar reminder, it, it constantly updates, and, and all the CRMs do this. So, like, let's say you've exchanged – let's say you have someone in a 90-day follow-up bucket, and on day 89, you happen to exchange an email with them. That resets the clock, and so they will remind you 90 days later instead of reminding you a day later, which doesn't do you any good because you've already exchanged emails with that, pe that person. So if you want to learn more about this, you can check it out at smartbusinessrevolution.com slash follow dash up dash networking. I've got a little tutorial there on, on how I do it. Now, another great example, Kevin O'Keefe, who's the founder of lexblog.com, uh, um, he has a blog called Real Lawyers Have Blogs, and he uses blog posts to build relationships. Um, in his case, he's trying to do it primarily with um, other thought leaders, other professionals, other journalists. So he'll read an article that he sees, uh, and anyone – you can all do this, by the way. He'll read an article that he, that, he, that he likes by someone that he wants to get to know a little bit better, and he will write a blog post about that article, and he'll quote a little bit from the article, link back to it, mention their Twitter standing. Uh, Twitter handle, and then he will uh, provide his own take, like a little bit of insight, and then he will email the person or share it on Twitter so that the person knows about it, and inevitably then that person uh, – John, you've just cut out. John, we, we lost you there. Hear me, Stephanie? Yep, we got you back. Okay, sorry about that. Um, and so Kevin has used this strategy in order to just form some really powerful relationships. So, And then also on email newsletters, if you want to a little bit, know a little bit more about that, um, just go to smartbusinessrevolution.com slash start dash here. Uh, but I want to ask one final question before we wrap things up here, and the question is, are you passionate about your practice today? And we got the answers at the beginning, and a lot of people said that they're not. And so what I want to inspire you to do today is if you don't love your practice, you know, what can you do today that will make your tomorrow better? And how would it make you feel if you take that one small step towards making a change? Because I want to – abolish unhappy lawyers. That would make me so happy. So my challenge is to you after this presentation is I gave you a lot of different ideas here. What is one action you will take based on the strategies I covered today? And you can share them on Twitter if you like. You can tell your spouse if you like. You can use the action that you'll take to based on the strategies today. I'll tell you a little bit about my um, course, and then we'll move on to Q&A. So I've got a course called Six Figure Law Firm. As Stephanie mentioned at the beginning, it, the reason it came about was because literally for a couple of years, I had a lot of lawyers who'd send me emails often at 2 a.m. on a Saturday night while they were working saying, oh, John, uh, can I pick your brain? Can I get you a cup of coffee? And you can tell me how I can uh, get out of this. So finally what I decided to do is I was going to take all my best advice and I'm going to package it up and create a self-paced video, high-quality uh, training, the kind of training that I couldn't find when I started my own firm, and I'm going to put it online. And that's what I did. It's called Six Figure Law Firm, and it's basically how to go from no law firm whatsoever to a six-figure law firm in just a few months. And it's for – you know even if you're starting out, even if you don't know where to start, even if you have no clue what to do first – it's really a step-by-step -step system. I've got homework assignments and templates and worksheets 
best of all of my advice and hard-earned wisdom all included in one place. And I don't want to go over all this, but these are all the different things that are included in there. It's a $397 um, uh, enrollment cost, and um, you can sign up today if you want. I'm going to keep it open just for a couple days because I like to control the flow of people who are coming in there. So if you go to sixfigurelawfirm.com slash mycase dash sign up, it'll be open until this Friday at midnight Pacific time. Okay, so sixfigurelawfirm.com slash mycase dash sign up. And by the way, just for everyone who's on this mycase webinar, I've got a special bonus. I don't, I try to avoid doing a lot of coaching, but everyone always wants to have that one on one experience to talk about their situation. So if you'd like to get a 20 minute kickstart coaching call, honestly, it often goes a little bit longer um, than uh, anyone who signs up before the end of this webinar. So just before the end of this webinar, we've got another 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I will give you a 20-minute kickstart coaching call with me, okay? And it's got a 60-day money-back guarantee. If you don't like it, you can return it. Um, and so finally, the special gift I mentioned at the beginning, the 20 tools and technology for starting a successful law firm. You can go to sixfigurelawfirm.com slash tech, T-E-C-H, and check that out there, sixfigurelawfirm.com slash tech. We'll be emailing out these links afterwards in case anyone wants them. And then finally, an extra bonus, which I didn't even talk about at the beginning, but I'm just going to send it off to you guys. Um, these are three different checklists for managing relationships with past clients, potential clients, and referral partners, which I will be emailing out to all of you after this. So um, with that, then I guess we can move on to Q&A. Okay, Stephanie? great. You're very timely. Thank you, John. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was really motivating and a lot of information. Thank you so much for that. Um, for those of you who have to leave us now, please take note of three things. My case offers a 30-day free trial, and because you attended this webinar today, you get a bonus discount. So please note that promo code. That's 10COR15. Secondly, when you close the webinar, a five-question survey will pop up. Please take a quick moment to answer these survey questions, and for more incentive, we will randomly select one lucky survey responder to receive that $50 Amazon gift card that I've mentioned previously. And also, you will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the blog where you'll find these slides, the webinar recording, and the Amazon gift card winner. Um, and so now I'm going to move on to some of these fantastic questions. We do have a lot. We won't get to all these today, um, but I have selected a few. Um, so our first one, actually, kind of going back, you had mentioned something about a book about givers. Yes. You, Give, what was yeah. that? A lot of people asked what that was called. Yeah, Give and Take by Adam Grant. Give and Take by Adam Grant came out about two years ago now. Um, he's a professor at Wharton. Okay, great. Excellent. And um, what program do you use for your email newsletters? Um, I use AWeber. Um, there's a lot of different options out there. There's MailChimp, um, more expensive options. Um, there's some new ones that are coming out there. The main ones are MailChimp and AWeber. Okay, great. Um, next question, do you have to take any client that comes through the door or is it best to choose one or two fields and be selective? Now, I remember in your presentation you did mention to stick with one field, but I think this is coming from someone who is really opening a new firm. Really yeah, I mean, this is the fear that I, yeah, this is the fear that everyone has, especially when you're starting your own firm. You're thinking like, how can I possibly turn something away? And to be honest, in the beginning, you probably shouldn't unless you have a lot of work coming in right at the beginning. So it's okay to, to take in some things as long as you feel like you can competently handle it. Um, but eventually over time, and this is what I did in my own experiences, is I, I just decided to start making that shift and to start turning away the other type of work. Um, or it might happen to you, like it might dry up. That's happened frequently where a completely practice area dries up. So you want to be aware of those types of changes happening along the line. But I think it's okay when, you, when you're just starting your own firm to be more all-inclusive and then over time to get more selective. Great. That's very good advice. Uh, next question. How do you manage casework with volunteering, networking in the beginning when you're doing all your startup work? Well, I mean, that really gets to the, um, the point that I made earlier about being laser-focused laser and efficient and targeted in the people that are going to lead to the right, right kind of business for you. So when I was doing short sale consultations, 
I was attracting the wrong kind of people. I decided that I wanted to attract business owners and entrepreneurs, and so that shifted everything. It shifted the people that I would associate with, have lunches with, have coffees with on a week-to-week, month-to-month basis, spent time with. It shifted the organizations that I would get involved with. It shifted the events which I would attend. For example, a couple of months ago, I spent more money than I've ever spent before to attend a two-day conference because it was filled with high-level entrepreneurs, exactly the kind of people that I want to be around, surround myself with. So it's about really being laser-focused, knowing clearly the types of people that you want to surround yourself with, and then honing in on how you can um, provide value to them and surround yourself with them. Okay, excellent. Um, A few people did inquire about what you use for conference calls, meeting with clients that are far away. I did mention Skype, um, but she was wondering if you had any other better options that you feel work well. That's all in the uh, tech, uh, sixfigurelawfirm.com slash tech, T-E-C-H. You can grab that there. Um, There's some different options there. But as far as conference calling goes, there's a couple options these days. I mean, you can use Skype. uh, Google Hangout is a good solution. See people face-to-face. Or uh, another one is freeconferencecall.com, completely free. I don't know how they make money off of it. No, they have some premium services. But freeconferencecall.com, you can do multiple uh, people, I think up to 10 people on a conference call. Okay. Wow, great. Yeah, Google Hangouts is definitely a good option. Yep. Um, okay, and how have you used LinkedIn in your practice to, to get those paying clients? Um, honestly, I'm, I, on my podcast, um, I've interviewed a couple of different LinkedIn experts, and I've never been an aggressive user of LinkedIn other than, well, the, the number one um, mistake that people make with LinkedIn is not filling out their profile, and a lot of lawyers are guilty of this. Here's the problem. Someone Googles your name, especially if you have a distinctive name, probably the first thing that's going to pop up even before your website is your LinkedIn profile. The people pop over to that. They'll take a look. They'll find there's hardly any information there, and then they'll bounce. You'll never know about them. You'll never, you'll never know that someone, that someone was checking you out, but they, they will just not continue to go any further. So it doesn't take that much of your time to fill out your profile and make sure it's accurate. Make sure that, you know, I, I contact people all the time. I'm like, hey, I saw your profile. I said this. They're like, oh, yeah, that was like a few years ago. So <laughs> make sure you've got the most up-to-date information on there. And then, but as far as, like, going out and then getting clients through LinkedIn, I mean, basically, I will connect with people on LinkedIn. So if I meet someone, oftentimes I'll go on LinkedIn and make a connection with them, reportive, which unfortunately is not in use anymore. It used to be a great Gmail plugin that was helpful with this. Um, but So I'll connect with people on LinkedIn, and that way you always have got their up-to-date contact info, and you remain in touch with them, and they might read, you know, maybe if you wrote an article, you can share it on LinkedIn. So I do share articles that I've written on LinkedIn, but that's pretty much the extent of my usage of it. Okay, great. Um, and it looks like we'll have time for this last question which is a really good one, and many people have asked it in different ways. Uh, in terms of the virtual office, you know, at the beginning you mentioned the few things that you need, um, a place to work, that sort of thing. In terms of the virtual office, any advice on how to go about meeting clients and making them comfortable with the fact that you are not meeting them in an office? You know, I find, well, you mean in, in a virtual office, like if you're meeting someone in a coffee shop or, or if you're meeting yes. someone in, yeah. And that's, the, that's the kind of gist of it that, that I'm getting from everyone's questions. Yeah, I mean, I find that you know you're you're not especially when you're starting out, and if you're starting a small firm, um, you're not going to be competing with people who are then going and comparing you to a firm with a hundred lawyers that's got a very expensive downtown office, prime real estate. Um, so there's a couple of so they so they're not expecting that higher level. They're you're probably charging less, but you're making a good living, and so they they're not going to expect a really high level of service. I mean, in my office here, I share an office with a couple of other uh, attorneys, and we we don't even have a receptionist at the front, and I've never had a receptionist who's come in and offered coffee and sweetener and all that kind of stuff, and I've never once in four years had anyone complain, or, you know, maybe some people decided not to hire me for that reason, 
but you know it's a little bit of a trade-off. They know that they're paying less than they would be, but you're still making a good living off of it. And then the other thing is you know, using a virtual office. I mean, you if you work out of your home, but you want to work, you want to meet with clients somewhere, you can you can pay a monthly fee anywhere from like you know a hundred dollars or more just for the address and and maybe maybe they answer your phones, and then you can also meet with clients there. Or you can meet at a local law library with people. Or depending on the practice area, you can you can say you can meet at a quiet restaurant or something like that. Um, right. I I've gotten to the point where I don't I don't meet with clients very frequently face to face. Um, and and eventually I started not like I, I started screening people over the phone. I didn't even want to sit down for a free consultation anymore because I might be there for forty five minutes giving free advice and they don't turn they don't become a client. And I didn't notice any real reduction. So. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Probably very comforting to a lot of people to ask that question as well. Um, yeah. So, John, we do have a lot of other questions. I'm sorry, everyone, we couldn't get to those today, but we are out of time. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for attending, and John, thank you so much. That was a lot of very useful advice, and everyone, we will have the, the follow-up on our blog tomorrow, and if you registered, you'll receive a link um, to the recap and the recording. So, John, thank you again, and thanks to everyone Excellent. for attending. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Have and a good day. Bye-bye.